Good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Luis Cano. I am the founder and director of the Rainbow Platform, uh, the liberal initiative for more diversity in uh, politics. Uh, we work uh, within the framework of Renew Europe of ALDE to bring up more diversity and representation. And then uh, in this occasion, we're working with the Friendly Nima Foundation, in case you don't know it the German Foundation for Freedom uh, and to Activity Politics. So uh, today, uh, I'm very happy to be surrounded by this uh, very good panel. I'm with uh, Maria Luz uh, from the 66, a council member of the city of Amsterdam, and formerly very active with uh, Pink in Blue, which is a network of the um, of Dutch police uh, working on uh, LGBT issues. Right? I'm also with uh, Leonard Salmink, uh, who is a uh, former member or member of the presidency of uh, the VVD, uh, uh, the People's Party for Freedom and Democracy in the Netherlands, and also a board member of Liberal International. Thank yes. you so much for being here. And with Herbert from uh the one of the deputy mayors of the city of Budapest, and also board member of the presidency of Momentum, uh, Mogelum, our Liberal Party in Hungary. Uh, today we're going to be speaking a little bit about diversity and representation. We're going to be speaking as well a little bit about the racing uh, anti-LGBT rhetoric that is happening not only in Hungary but also all across Europe. Uh, we're going to be trying to compare the Dutch and Hungarian realities and maybe we can start with a little bit of introduction of what do we understand with this big concept that we have, diversity. I mean, we use the word so big um, and then this is something that is very... Uh, of an identity of the Rainbow Platform that we don't talk uh, only about LGBT representation, we don't talk only about female representation. Several people ask us why our rainbow is only one color, uh, and it's not because it was cheaper to produce. Uh, it was because <laughs> actually it's more of a question of it's, it represents a little bit more the inclusive part. So maybe Maria, what do you understand as diversity and representation? And maybe you can also reflect on what does the sex, the sex, uh, Democrat 66, uh, understand as diversity and representation? Um, well, I have heard the, um, the comparison that diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance at the party. Equity which is yet another step uh, further, is being asked to organize the party. So um, as far as diversity goes, I think diversity is a very broad term, as you said. And it does, of course, include the LGBTIQ community, but it also has components like age, um, uh, color, um, education level, all kinds of levels of diversity. And if I then reflect back at D66, D66 is actually very active at this point on this topic of diversity inclusion, because we realize that if we want to be reflective of our electorate, if we want to be reflective of the people that we say we represent, then we must also show that to the outside world. The same goes for the police department that I have worked for for 16 and a half years in Amsterdam. Um, Amsterdam is a very, very diverse city. It has, I believe, 179 different nationalities. Well, if you want to be of service to a city with people that are that diverse, you need to reflect that in your organization. And that also goes for D66 and for any political party, as far as I'm concerned. Great. Uh, maybe let me follow up with you on that, because Maria is right. I mean, Amsterdam is a very diverse city, but you were working also in the national level, in the board of the party. and then. Yep. How, how does David see his diversity also on the national uh, arena? Well, maybe first to say I'm very happy to be in this panel, and also very happy to be within this panel with Maria, because Pink and Blue, what it does in the Netherlands for safety for LGBTI people, um, it, it's really important, and I think really one of the most uh, effective ways actually to deal with, um, uh, one, of, one of the best examples actually that we have and how we can help individuals to be safe. Uh, but also, it's of course a sad thing that it's still, uh, still necessary. 
maybe it's good to start with what <coughs> uh, diversity means for me personally. Um, because I think eventually personally is about your identity. When I was like a teenager, I realized actually quite young that I was um, uh, a homosexual person, that I was someone falling in love with uh, people of the same sex, that I liked a guy. So I think it was 11 years old actually when I realized. But even though I grew up in a very liberal family, in a liberal country, it took me, I think, six or seven years before I was ready to accept the term homosexuality for myself. Um, and it was not because I doubted my sexuality, it was not because I doubted the reaction of my parents, but it was because I was very uncertain about the fact what society would do to me if I would come out as homosexual. And I think <clears throat> if we even have this feeling as young people in the Netherlands, um, which was already at the time a liberal government, I grew up in, an, in a time where actually our two parties, T66 and PVD, were together in government with the uh, Social Democrats, and we were at the time the first country to introduce same-sex marriage. Um, which is another great solution, of course, for problems with uh, with diversity. But even then, it, it was a big issue for me to come out. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, I'm serious listening. So one of the main reasons, actually, I believe diversity is important, is because you need to have like the role models in politics, so you know that you're not alone, that you're represented, that what you are is something normal and um, something that does exist, and it's not something that is different in society. Uh, so as a teenager, I wasn't ready for all the stereotypes that people put on homosexuality. I think if I look at politics right now, I see much more LGBTI people at serious positions uh, as minister or uh, uh, members of parliament. They were at the time, but it was much less visible. So I think what it does for me is also as an individual and as a politician, how I look at diversity on a political level. Because for me, diversity is not like seeing people as being part of a certain community. Of course, everyone can associate themselves in a different kind of community as they want to be. But especially the thing that I felt as teenager, like all the stereotypes because you are a certain person, breaking that away, but put on the liberal glasses and say, this is an individual. Mm -hmm. And this individual is a person, and all the stereotypes that we put there are not necessary, because this is an individual that makes its own choices, or her own choices. It, either it can be homosexual and many other things, uh, but making sure that we as politicians or as society, see the individual rather than being part of a certain community, part of a certain group. And breaking it with the barriers that you can make your own choices, no matter what your feelings are or what your identity is. Thank you. In, uh, let's go local with Gabor. Momentum has been one of the uh, few parties that actually bravely was the first party that uh, decided <coughs> also to march during Pride and, 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 and diversity has been always a value with Momentum. Has broadened with the time. Uh, what do you think it means, diversity for Momentum today, and also for you? I think there is a certain difference, uh, not in the fact that I'm also very happy to be on this panel with uh, in this uh, company, and I think we have uh, very different experiences. And I think that in the past 30 years after the transition, um, we had an expansion of uh, liberal and individual values, but there has always been uh, a background of uh, the uniform, uniformizing effect of uh, national identity. So um, I think uh, conservatives, not only Fidesz, but their forerunners in uh, Hungarian Democratic Forum, which was the first uh, freely elected uh, government, um, um, they always uh, try to promote the idea that you first and foremost belong to the national community and your individual values, your individual individuality comes second after that. And I think there has been an expansion of uh, the liberal uh, idea of, of, of being an individual, but that is... I think with the democratic backsliding, I think it has also been withdrawn. And um, Momentum actually was founded by people who find diversity to be very natural, to be uh, friends with all kinds of people, and who had the, uh, uh, who had the idea that they have to find, found a party on that basis. So to, to uh, to be one of the core values. And I think uh, they have, uh, we have uh, tried to institutionalize that within the party. 
Uh, we have a very strong LGBT community in our party. I th uh, our uh, Roma community is starting to become uh, organized. And uh, I think we uh, always try to take care of, uh, of, uh, of our relations with each other. No, in this sense. But there is one thing uh, which, uh, which is somewhat disturbing or which we have to uh, very, very uh, mindfully uh, do against is that uh, Momentum has been founded by people who are very much alike in the age group and in the uh, formative experiences that led to the uh, formation. So uh, I think we have uh, difficulties in trusting the outside world, in relating uh, to people, in admitting newcomers, integrating newcomers. And I think we have to work on that very, very hard. And uh, this goes against diversity in a certain sense, even if uh, the inner workings of the party um, or I think uh, the best in Hungary in this sense. Something that you said that actually caught a lot of my attention <coughs> is the question of national identity. Um, not long ago, I was actually in the in the Netherlands and I was complaining because I was uh, just telling uh, some colleagues and uh, I was in the desk, the coffee, sorry. <laughs> and uh, and I was just complaining that the Hungarian Parliament doesn't doesn't have the European flag. Mm -hmm. And the response of my Dutch colleague was, we don't even have the Dutch flag in our parliament. It took us a few decades before we were there. Yeah. It was a big step for us. So it's an interesting thing. There's a picture of the king, though. But that's yeah. as but far European as it goes. As it and there's a European flag on the top of the, on the roof. Okay. Yeah. But then the, the reason why I bring this up is actually because when it comes to questions of identity, and then uh, maybe we can go a little bit on philosophy. I mean, like I think that uh, if if we have not been acquainted with the with the work of Kuyama, for example, on identity, I think it's it's actually very interesting to see the fact that many uh, people gravitate towards a political party because they feel they they want to belong uh, to mm -hmm. something. Interestingly enough. And then the reason why I bring up is like you're completely right about national identity. But then one of the things that we have seen is that the LGBT community or the Roma community, for example, or communities that are underrepresented, they feel certain shame to actually be identified with a certain nationality. I meet so many Hungarians abroad that they are like, well, I'm more European <laughs> that I am first European, I'm LGBT, and then I'm Hungarian. Interestingly enough, I mean, I am Hungarian myself, and then I identify myself first as a Hungarian, then as a LGBT and as a European third. But then I think this is the question of how do political parties, you know, deal with these mergences of identity? Because we are, we're not talking to individuals that are just like on boxes. I think that that is the difference uh, between liberal parties mm -hmm. and uh, a more socialist parties that we we try to put not people on the boxes but try to focus on the individual right so my question to you uh maybe we can just uh, whomever wants to take it is how do we merge that conversion of identities i mean like how political parties are approaching different communities knowing that an individual is not just lgbt is also an, a member of a national uh group that is maybe, you know, like, a, a not like a, coming from a different ethnicity, intersectionality. How do we approach people and what messages do we bring that are not dividing us more, but integrating us more? Maybe we can start. Well, yeah. Go ahead, Leonard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't want well, to take the floor uh, for the first time again. Yeah, well, I think it's the first answer to very much where, where I started, like, for me, um, diversity as a liberal is something looking at people as an, um, as an individual. Individuals have different identities. Personally, I'm born and raised in Amsterdam, but also partly raised in Groningen in the north part of the Netherlands. So I feel connected to my country, of course, the Netherlands. I feel home in Amsterdam. I feel connected to Groningen, which is the northern part of the Netherlands. Um, and I have several other identities. I feel home in a liberal family. I feel very much home in the Netherlands. And I have a strong European heart. So I have multiple identities. And I think for many people, identity is not being just one group. And that's exactly, I think, what we as uh, liberals should promote, is that, lib that identity is much more complicated than just, well, this is an LGBTIQ plus person. And even within, of course, the LGBTIQ 
Q plus community, there are huge, um, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, diverse uh, people there. So I think it, it's very much a liberal answer. And the question about can gay people or LGBTI people relate to any kind of flag? I think many people in the Netherlands feel very proud about LGBTI people about living in the Netherlands because we are used to be still in the rankings and diverse, of course, from time to time. We, but we are a very progressive country, I think, in most aspects, uh, in many places. Um, however, what you said, like in the Netherlands, it's always complicated to show your own flag, except for King's Day, uh, which is the most unifying day, I think, uh, that we have, which is also part of our identity. If you graduate from high school, yeah, that's a with the work second top exactly. of it, yeah. 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 Okay, so yeah. what what I was talking about is uh, when national identity is used by a political party as an oppressive tool or right. as a uniformizing exactly. yeah. tool. Yeah. And uh, I think what a political party must avoid is actually to mistake itself for an, uh, for an interest representational organization of a certain minority group where identity, I mean, what Fukuyama is describing there is actually how identity leads to the fragmentation of society right, exactly. and of the falling apart of the whole thing. Right. So I, and I think a political party is, uh, is, is something that actually is a tool for integrating society, for trying to help people to, uh, to create surroundings uh, where they can actually uh, organize their lives um, and without without clashing on the boundaries of uh, uh, exclusive identities, so I think the multi multiplicity of identities is is a is a key word really, and it must be taken into account when you are creating a party. So yes, uh, when we have this uh, uh, thing that uh, there is this awful uh, thing about the Hungarian government using uh, uh, sexuality and, and um, uh, so politicizing gender and sexuality and, and uh, uh, really using the LGBT uh, community as scapegoats for whatever on the, on the Putin pattern, uh, we must be there, we must stand there, we must uh, defend uh, the liberal values that are being threatened, but then again, we must not mistake ourselves for an LG LGBT uh, interest representational pressure group. All right. And I think maybe, you know, I will, I will come back first with you because actually like that is the whole point, which is like integrative messages and then somehow, you know, we're talking about inclusion and then how political parties are representatives of all, el all elements of society. And then even though we're in Pride Week, I mean, this is a question of, for example, Momentum uses a lot, Bebede, the sister sex as well, the question of human rights and individual freedoms over the question of only representing one in specific group. However, let's look retro introspectively because the reason why we're doing these discussions in different capitals of Europe mm -hmm. is because different parties have different solutions. And then, we just came uh, from Vienna, where we had a very interesting conversation with our political party there, NEOS. And NEOS rejects the idea that there has to be any interest group within their party. They don't have a women empowerment group. They do not have either an LGBT group. However, Momentum has a very strong LGBT group, as you said. You do have also an interesting group. Right, sex to sex. Yeah. Absolutely. You are a member of Right, sex to sex. And maybe let's start yeah. with you on that. What is the role of those interest groups then within the parties themselves? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I'm a, um, a member of the national board of Pride 66, and I have just given an interview for the uh, for the bi-monthly magazine of D66. And the title of the interview was, um, because it was a quote that I had made, and apparently it stood out enough for them to use it as the title, was that visibility comes for, before acceptance. So I think a very good reason to do have interest groups within a liberal political party is because it promotes uh, visibility of that group. <coughs> that would allow for people in the outside world, in the, in the communities, to see that they are reflected 
in that political party. Um, you see, there are a couple of catches 22 that I've heard. I think f first and foremost that every person inherently is diverse. Everybody exactly. is diverse. So, you know, on the one hand, you can say that you strive for uh, full acceptance of everybody and we do not want to have any special interest groups because we want to be accepting of everybody and at the same time that does not work <coughs> at least and of course i'm speaking from my dutch experience what we have found and again within the police too is that the the, the reason for there being an, an Rose in Blau LGBTQIQ police network was because first and foremost, the LGBT police officers organized themselves. Because I know of people who are still working for the police and who I have worked with in this network who have said, I thought I was the only gay guy in the, in the entire mm -hmm. department. There's six and a half thousand people working for the Amsterdam Police Department, and he thought he was the only gay guy. So after the gay games, actually, in 1998 in Amsterdam, pink and blue was, I guess, how do you call that? It, 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 was, it started being organized because there were hundreds of thousands, literally, people coming from all over the world to be part of these gay games and many of them had every reason to be very afraid of their police so we wanted to have a safe environment and welcome people but that was also the beginning of pink and blue and many times we have had the discussion internally that all the other officers would say well you want to integrate why would you have a separate group for lgbt officers you want to integrate and the answer that we always gave them was, but visibility comes before acceptance. Okay. And, you know, as time progressed, people started to become more accepting of the fact that there was a pink and blue and saw the operational added value. Because when there was a case involving the LGBTIQ community, the, the, um, the investigative departments knew how to find us and said, would you join us for a couple of weeks because we have this seriously murder and we need to interview the social network of the victim. But we, we feel that there's a reluctance to talk to us. Would you come in and talk to us? And that is an example that I think can be transferred also to political parties because if you have role models and people who are visibly out there and open as to who they are, regardless of the particular identity that they choose to be out and open about, you know, I, it can be because somebody is, you know, part of the LGBTIQ community, but it can also be somebody who is a female and wants to be um, recognized and acknowledged as a female politician. You know, it can be anything. It can be a person of color. <coughs> um, so, yeah, my take on, you know, not having separate interest groups, I understand it. I understand from which angle they approach this. I have a different experience and I don't agree with it. No, I can, yeah, shortly comment. First, when it comes to pink and blue, I can remember that when I was, um, I think, like late student, uh, there were a few incidents with, um, uh, I think, gay men being attacked in Amsterdam. So there was some anxious within the gay community, like, what's going on? And are we still safe here? Can we still go out and enjoy our evenings here? And I can remember, I went out on one of those evenings in the David Zwarstraat, which is the main uh, LGBTI strip in, uh, in Amsterdam. And actually, we were drinking there, and I think well, I, I had a few drinks already. And the police came to me, actually, but I was pink and blue. So they were not judging me for drinking a little bit too much in the evening, but just asking, Hey, are you enjoying your evening here? Is there anything all right? Did you see anything that was uh, um, uh, that you don't trust? Would you like to talk any, anything about it? this? Is our number? If there's anything, just let us know. And that was a very important signal for me, I think, as a, um, as, a as a student, like I can feel safe here, and also I can trust on the authorities here in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the main issue. I think from, I mean, for me, I was already out of the closet, of course, and I was just an open gay man there, but. 
the main reason, of course, why um, pink and blue was really necessary, uh, also within the internal organization, as you said, yeah. uh, which you uh, can explain. But, but also, of course, here we have closeted um, people who are reluctant to go to the police or they don't trust the authorities because they come from a different background, for example, where you don't trust the uh, authorities that much. It was very clear that if you're so accessible as, uh, as police <coughs> community, that it makes sense that you go to the police if there's if something happens. So mm -hmm. I think this is a great example where a certain LGBTI community or representation or organization within an organization can work. But one thing maybe, but also for debate to disagree a little bit, is eventually I believe as liberal party, our goal should be that, I mean, if you want to organize yourself amongst like-minded, whatever, it's all fine. But eventually it should be unnecessary to have an LGBTI network within your political party. Because I believe um, if you are a true liberal party, you always look at the individual level and then the group is less important and you always try to see what's necessary for individuals to be free and fair individuals as they want to be. So I would be very reluctant for my party, for example, to have like separate organizations for all sorts of minorities that of course do exist yeah. within a party. However, from the other side, if it helps for putting something on the table, as you say, to make yourself visible before you can change something, it's good to start something up, but as, an, as a liberal party, I think the next step is that we absorb, like, this is the kind of the, uh, diversity that we believe in. Those are things that we need to change in society. Now let's all bring it together into one liberal family again. You know, and I think there's, there, there's a level of emancipation already that is going on. I mean, I think that, as, and I'm speaking, of course, from my perspective, from, you know, being a um, city council member for D66, having had the experience in the Amsterdam Police Department, you know, there is a level of emancipation. And at the same time, in an ideal world, I agree with you, Leonard, because in an ideal world, you know, there would, it, it would not be necessary to have an LGBTIQ police network. We would not have Pride 66 because, you know, everything at the lawmaking level would be taken care of. There would be equal rights. Uh, there would be no hostility in the broadest sense of the word against the LGBTIQ community, you know, and the gay games will be organized next year in Iran, you know, then we're there. <laughs> then we can say, okay, you know, we had a 24 hour hotline. When you met these officers, they probably gave you the number of that 24 hour hotline. You know, we have actually said more than necessary. once, yeah. mm -hmm. if, if that hotline is not ringing anymore, you know, and Their we're coming done. together yeah. and saying, you know, what, what are we going to do, guys? Because there's not, you know, of course, absolve, <coughs> absolving pink and blue, absolving Pride 66 is the ultimate goal. But it's not going to be in my time, I'm afraid. So it's, it, um, this is a very funny story, just like Gabriel will, will empathize. When we started with Momentum in 2017, we were operating in a very um, stinky basement. <laughs> uh, it was actually a very underground movement and so on. And I remember having this conversation when we start, started deciding, establishing an LGBT network. And at the time we had, um, I was working with these three colleagues, uh, with Peter, uh, Vera and Milan. Uh, and then uh, we were discussing this was 2017, we were not even a political party by then. We were saying, why do we need this? And then uh, I remember Bella, one of our colleagues, mentioning, well, because I dream of a world when we're not needed, but unfortunately we need, <laughs> we need to exist first in order to make path for that. Momentum then has a network for the elderly, has a network for, uh, for uh, women uh, in politics, an LGBT network, now developing also a Roman network uh, or an emancipation group. How do you feel the role actually in the Hungarian reality is of having these networks within the party and the value of these networks? Um, it, uh, I think it is needed very much uh, because I think that uh, uh, our politicians and our organization uh, has to be made aware of the special experiences, special points of view uh, of different uh, minority groups within the party and uh, uh, outside of the party. Uh, and I think the role uh, sometimes uh, 
Unfortunately, it depends on the quality of the output that is done by these uh, representation groups. I think the uh, uh, LGBT group is doing a very fine work, both in the organizational sense, they put uh, a lot of uh, a lot of energy into um, uh, uh, into promoting visibility and things like that. Uh, then again, there are some groups where um, um like for instance uh the women uh, the women's network they developed this institution called uh horizon which is uh an institution for training uh, uh um women politicians and i think they have a they have a different approach and uh they they are doing a very fine work i think they they have their uh third year graduating now yeah and uh the people who attend there and i think they are fantastic people and they are one of the uh one of the sources of new uh of new politicians for momentum so i think that's a that's a, a great thing and um so i think they are uh they are very useful and uh in transforming the party as well, and in transforming uh, the way our politicians act uh, in front of the outside world. So, uh, uh, yes. All right. All right. You, you bring uh, uh, up the topic that I wanted to transition in, which is empowering for programs, right? I mean, one thing is to have these networks, but normally these networks, and then maybe also you can put the hat of Labor and International here. We Alone in Alde, in the liberal family in the European level, we have 74 bodies working together. Out of those 74 bodies, uh, <coughs> this is actually very fun, that only 16 bodies have LGBT networks. A majority of those networks work in policy or during Pride. <laughs> very good. In the middle, they don't do much. And then this is a question of like the value of these networks at the end of the day. And then uh, in, in Alde, we have two programs. We have Alliance of Her, which is uh, working, uh, as you say, to prepare female candidates, mm -hmm. and then they have local hubs, like for example, Horizon here. And then we have the Rainbow Platform, but then in Rainbow Platform, we don't work with candidates. Uh, compliance, first of all. But then second of all, is because we don't do anything training the best candidates if their parties are not going to put them on the list. And then we have this question of systemic problems. I mean, do empowerment programs work because then there's a question of, I agree, like many women, many LGBT people, many people from the Roma community will actually doubt into getting themselves in the front. But our parties and then our liberal parties doing well when, it's to, when the question is to bring people in to a list or to the front. Uh, we have not seen that. This is also like a very good self-criticism to our, towards our parties. Uh, and what can we do? Empowerment programs? Do you think the work you started already speaking a little bit about Horizon, but do you think that that we should be doing more empowerment to these people to actually run as candidates? Well, it depends on what you mean actually by empowerment. All right. Uh, so, uh, I would say there is a lot of a uh, lot of work to be done in encouraging, but if uh, uh you you also include quotas in in empowerment then i would definitely say no so um yeah it, it, it i think a lot of people uh need encouraging and also a, a, an encouraging environment has to be developed and uh i think that uh um, talking a lot about about these issues can make you discover uh, what situations and what your personal behaviors in different situations are discouraging for other people that you wouldn't actually notice. Correct. Well, uh, some, something funny that, that you say because is we come from Austria, the party opposes completely quotas. Next year, next week, we go to Bratislava, a party that has implemented quotas in cases of emergencies. 
However, Progressive Slovakia, for the first time, has drafted a list where 76 women are running versus 74 men in the list. No need of quotas. They didn't need the quota because the quota is called an emergency. Quotas or not quotas, that's a very big, uh, hot uh, topic on the, on the thing. I personally don't agree with so quotas, but I think that we remember. <laughs> but uh, maybe I, I want to, to go to Leonard with this first, but then again with the, with the hat of Libre International, maybe seeing it also comparatively, I mean, uh, do you think that quotas is something that uh, we see a lot in uh, liberal parties? I don't think you see it a lot actually when it comes to LGBTI representation um, in general. I think when it comes to female representation, um, it has been a very controversial and useful tool, I think, as a kind of emergency break. If you would have wanted to break through patterns where there's only male dominance or where it doesn't work, it to get any, or with ethnicities, for example, it can be very useful. But in itself, I don't think it's, it's eventually a liberal solution. And when it comes to the, whether it's the European or the Allied perspective, I think that um, like on a national level, I just believe political parties should make sure that diversity is much more uh, than having one person of color and one LGBTI person in your parliamentary group. But that is not diversity, that's just making sure you tick the boxes. Real diversity means that your team is like a real diverse team with people with different attitudes, people with different backgrounds from the entire country with 50-50 male, uh, female representation, LGBTI, ethnicities, etc. So you have a diverse team and making sure that everyone um, uh, feels represented. So I think um, what works actually is, for example, indeed the Alliance of Europe, because it gives certain um, candidates the feeling that when they go back home, like Alliance of Europe is in the program for uh, female candidates um, all over Europe, exactly. Um, that gives those candidates the feeling that when I go back home, I have the opportunity <coughs> and the capabilities actually to become a, a politician because I learned it on the international level. So therefore, and I think that's a very liberal thing. We do it a bit liberal international, for example, in Northern Africa. Uh, that's not specifically for LGBTI or male or female candidates. We make sure we have a very diverse team of young people, giving them the best trainings from international trainers and they go back home to their own political parties, which eventually they have to be empowered to change their political parties, even if they're liberal, but too conservative in certain issues. Um, so I believe actually also for uh, Rainbow Platform uh, by empowering LGBTI persons throughout the European Union and in some countries more an issue than in other parts of the world, but um, that it is important actually that you take people to like a different context, empower them like you're a good politician, go back to your constituency and make sure that you convince your political party to put you on the list. I think those, those programs can be very strong and very encouraging. Thank you. And then uh, let me go back to you because the reason why I want to go with you is I like my data. Uh, right now we have uh, 48 parties, that, uh, poly liberal political parties that have signed and work uh, actively with the Rainbow Platform because they have signed the Dublin Declaration for Diversity. And then out of those 48 uh, parties, three parties, three, <coughs> have a diversity officer and a talent manager who is encouraging people. The sex to sex is one of them, Alia. Mm-hmm. How does that impact, for example, in encouraging people to run for office? It does. It does. I, again, you know, by having somebody visible like Hadia Tu um, is, is, is helping to raise awareness about the importance of diversity and inclusion. I've always said this is not, you know, let, let's all be nice to everybody issue. It's a business issue. Because diversity, in the broadest sense of the word, actually um, um, improves the quality of decision making. And as far as female representation goes, you know, uh, D66, for instance, has the Els Borst Netwerk. And Els Borst used to be a minister, and she actually was murdered well beyond her retirement age by somebody who did not agree with the decisions that she had made on euthanasia in the Netherlands. And ultimately she was murdered at her house. And this was of course a shock to everybody. But anyway, Els Borst was also the woman, and this is a famous quote of hers, who said that politics is too important to leave it up to men alone. So she deserved a network 
that carries her name. And I'm mentioning that too because part of what the Els Bosch Network does is um, there's a mentoring program for women who are not quite convinced if this is something for her because women um, are brought up to believe that they have to tick all the boxes before they can have a solid chance of reaching a certain goal. You know, research has shown that if you have like a vacancy for any job and there are, you know, five requirements that men think at two, three, oh, I think I, I can apply, I, I, I can be a good candidate. And women feel like they have to have all those five boxes ticked. So as far as encouragement goes, absolutely, but also support. So um, experienced female politicians are asked to mentor somebody who is thinking about a, a woman, a young woman, not necessarily young, but somebody who is thinking about wanting to join politics at any level. So I think that is a very good uh, example of what you can do within such a, a, a separate group, within you know a, a, a group that you know identifies in this particular instance, or the identity is female. Um, but what you can actually do to bring the female representation in politics further? Mm -hmm. No, that that makes complete sense. And then, unfortunately, I mean that we have we have come to the part of the discussion where. Naturally, actually, you have mentioned political violence. Uh, and um, I want to bring up this, this question because uh, according to Yoga Europe, 2022 uh, was uh, the highest uh, year when it, like, we saw the highest peak on hate speech against uh, the LGBT community. And then uh, one of the main reasons quoted by the report was political speech. Uh, not only that, you mentioned also, and then obviously I'm, I'm quoting ILGA Europe, which is an LGBT organization, but uh, increasing, and then also because we have been having the discussions about the Istanbul Convention, increasing hate speech toward women, towards women, has also been increasing mm -hmm. incredible in the Netherlands. I think that, uh, not mean, like, if you are not familiar, mm -hmm. I mean that we had a case where uh, the leader of uh, Desex Desex, for example, uh, she was received uh, for in, uh, with protesters uh, in in one occasion with torches in in uh, recently. So so we do see this at this, her house. At her yes. house, and this, this is yeah. this is this is one of these things that you see like you see political uh, speech inciting violence more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel? I mean, like, th let me start with this question: Have you, any of you, have felt? that the increasing tension or like the increasing political speech has affected you personally or your colleagues and what do you think parties have uh, a duty if the parties have a duty to support you and how uh, maybe we can start with Leonard because you were shaking your head quite actively <laughs> because of recognized in the Netherlands actually that's happening and I think an interesting example that you see in the Netherlands is um, like 15 years ago, we had the, the, the rising of the far right, of course, with Geert Wilders, leader of the Freedom Party, uh, very much an anti-Islamist uh, uh, political party. And actually, he was first in the beginning, he was kind of pro-gay because he believed uh, uh, he wanted to defend, he said, he, I want to defend our Dutch values. One of the values that we have is that we are tolerant towards gay people. Uh, those Muslims, that, that, that was the enemy of, uh, still is actually, of Geert Wilders. They are homophobic, so we are actually pro gay. It was basically, I think, the idea of, of the Freedom Party. Right now, uh, 10 to 15 years later, actually, this same political party and the same um, uh, person is actually in parliament arguing against the, okay. the gender cookies or against um, <coughs> the LGBTI ideology or whatsoever. Uh, so now it's very much put in the idea of there's. LGBTI ideology, which is a kind of woke ideology, and we are against them. Um, so the whole idea of the fact that he was kind of defending gay rights is now being swept away because of a kind of, I'm not sure actually where it comes from, but you see it very much here in Hungary as well, um, where I think Orban and Fidesz in the beginning 
didn't really touch LGBTI rights. I mean, they didn't improve it, but it didn't attack them either. But I think at the same period, like five to six years ago, uh, it, it came up actually that the LGBTI people were kind of too liberal, too left-wing. I'm, I'm not sure what it is exactly, uh, but not conservative enough and therefore should be fought against. So I recognize actually the new sort of uh, politicization and um, uh, yeah, politicization of the LGBTI movement within politics, which brings, brings me also to the point and main concern actually that I want to make in this panel is we can never take the progress for granted. The progress that we have is always something that we achieved at a time. <coughs> we have to fight to, main, to make sure that we maintain the progress that we have, like the fan that we have same-sex marriage, the fan that you can be who you are, the fan that you can change your uh, gender identity in, in uh, several countries. Um, but it, cause, it can be taken away, as it happens here right now in, in Hungary. Uh, it can be taken away as well in, um, uh, in the Netherlands by political movements who feel like there's kind of um, LGBTI movement that we have to fight against. So I do recognize it. Does it affect me personally? Well, I'm not that personal, but it, it, it very much concerns me that I see this as a kind of <coughs> politics, that the far right is so against the LGBTI movement and the LGBTI people become kind of enemy within a political line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe we can go with momentum because actually you mentioned the thing like the, the increasing uh, rhetoric here in Hungary, and, and I agree. I mean, that you already mentioned the rhetoric against the LGBT community. Hungary being one of the very few countries that did not sign uh, Istanbul Convention uh, before it became treaty by the European Union. So, like, how how do you feel that hate speech has permeated into or against uh, like our political figures and against the party itself? If I may come back to reflect on a bit on what Maria said before about awesome. uh, okay. uh, uh, encouraging and supporting uh, female politicians. Uh, um, I think we are we have this additional problem in Hungary that uh, to become a member of an opposition party or to consider being an opposition politician uh, basically uh, puts you in a very, very difficult position. And I think this relates to hate speech. I mean, uh, um, you are under an existential threat financially. Your your family may be losing their jobs and their contracts and things like that. So I think it's a decision to become an opposition politician, to come out as an opposition politician in Hungary. And that's not very good. Um, I think political violence has... Uh, um, Violent speech has been increasing in the last 10 or 15 years. So maybe, maybe you know, uh, Churka István, who was uh, one of the ideologists of uh, the Hungarian Democratic Forum. And uh, there is reason to believe that what Orban is basing his ideology on is very cl closely rela rela re related to that. And uh, in Hungary, what is happening is that based on the Russian pattern, gender uh, ideology, and the LD LGBT community is being uh, targeted as part of... Um, I think it's not that they're not conservative enough. I think they represent a kind of diversity that uh, 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 a monolithic political power does not want to tolerate. Yeah. And... Um, when I mentioned uh, national identity, I think what we have seen in the past 15 years is that uh, the, uh, the uh, central idea of uh, national identity in Hungary is becoming more and more ethnicity-based. And uh, this uh, violence, uh, the hate speech, is, I think, uh, uh, founded... On the, or based on the idea that you have to defend the core national values and everything is uh, uh, everything is allowed against anybody who would break that kind of uh, unity. Yeah. And uh, basically it is becoming one of the central points of, uh, of the Fidesz government that uh, our... Um, I mean, it's quite a good narrative, quite a useful narrative that uh, all their economic failures can actually uh, 
be defended by uh, the confrontation with uh, the European Union that wants to force gender ideology, migrants, whatever, whatever on us, and they are just defending our core national values, and therefore we are being punished. I mean, so that's quite a good defensive strategy, not a very constructive one if you uh, look at the future of the country, but... Yeah. Effective. Yeah. effective. Yeah. Maybe that's not saying good, but effective. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing that we actually have, we have a system of ambassadors in the uh, in the platform because, as you said, visibility comes before acceptance. We believe in that very much. So, but still, uh, out of the almost 150 ambassadors that we have, less than 10 are female, queer. Mm. We have a lot of female allies who have, uh, are very keen to it and we, we still believe that when it comes to representation because we focus ourselves in the individual freedom we actually need to have every ally but then if we come back to the question of topic how difficult actually it is for mm -hmm. you know like a queer female to actually join politics because the, the few ambassadors that we have that are, happen to be queer they mention very openly it's hard enough to be a woman imagine just being queer and then the amount of hate speech that we get mm -hmm. Well, I, I must say that um, the first thing that comes to mind when uh, you talk about hate speech where women are targeted is the what I call the anti-social media. Uh, I know that, for instance, Lisa van Ginneken, you know, the first transgender member of parliament in the Netherlands, has, um, has uh, closed her Twitter account because it was just an open sewer. The things that she would read on a daily basis was so ugly that she re really, out of self-protection, said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Sigrid Kaag, the party leader of D66, who you just referred to, has, um, st does still have a Twitter account, but has one of her... Um, what is that, policy assistance, if you will, monitor that. Because they once uh, calculated that every 15 minutes, every 15 minutes, she would get a hate comment. But really ugly. I mean, really nasty. Um, I am not on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram. Um, I'm not very active on LinkedIn. And my Facebook account is a private account. So, and I do that. And I know that part of being a politician is also being out there and showing, you know, what you've done. And LinkedIn for me is kind of a safe space. You know, that's kind of a decent social media platform where, you know, I've read some things there too, but overall it's fairly decent. Um, so I think that I have not really been subjected to any kind of hate speech because I kind of steer clear of social media. Mm -hmm. um, I have experienced hate speech in my career as an officer to the point where I've had on my personal address, um, and well, there's a name for it, I won't bother you with that, but the police has in Amsterdam, there's quite a few addresses where people live that if a 911 or a 112 calls comes from that address, there's an extra, there's a like a little flag and there's an extra sense of urgency to go there. And I've had that on my address because I've been severely threatened. But that's also because I have a twin sister and my twin sister, an identical twin sister, she is, um, she's a TV personality and she also has been threatened. And as a result of that, I've also had one of those things on my address because people may not see the difference, but really like, you know, I'm going to slit her throat, that type of stuff. So there have been a few moments where I have uh, been cautious when I uh, walked outside. Mm. But um, I also would like to, um, um, and you commented on that, Leonard. I also think that it is very important to not get complacent. And D66 is a party that, because, you know, I mean, sometimes people joke like, you know, 
we have Pride 66, but D66 is known as such an LGBTIQ um, oriented party that people are saying we should have a straight network. You know, where <laughs> you know there's so much about the LGBTIQ community that is part of D66 fabric. You know, we should have a we should have a straight network. But I also I do think that D66 should not get um, um, complacent and we need to keep that sense of urgency that um, we're not there yet and uh, even though you know things compared to other countries are much much better but still you know like you said Leonard it it is there's a there's a danger in in sitting back and relax and thinking you know what we're doing really well no there's there's always there's always more yeah, I think that actually, like the question of individual free, like like uh, taking freedom for granted. I mean, the reason uh, the Rainbow Platform is founded by two Hungarians. And then many times, actually, they like, they they tell us like, oh my God, you guys like or, like it's not the it's not not the more hospitable uh, place to actually start something like this. And then uh, always like the the conversation turns out of. Uh, when we started uh, the, the platform, we were talking about with uh, Swedish parties. Uh, and one of the Swedish parties was saying, but well, we don't have the problems of representation here. And I was like, don't we? <laughs> and it, it started this question of also like, you know, I'm, I'm also, uh, I was born in Venezuela. I, I saw the deterioration of democracy there. I came to Hungary, I saw the deterioration of it as well. And, um, and you know, like uh, democracy is such a fragile, uh, delicate uh, invention that 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 we we forget that the the, the struggle is, is is for us to continue there but then uh just as we started the rainbow platform which is something very positive and that has expanded quite quite much i want to end up because also we have come to the to, to a time where we need to close um i want to start like finish with a with a little bit of a positive note as well i mean uh, we have spoken about challenges of representation, we have spoken a little bit about, you know, how uh, difficult it is to engage people and then to make them uh, empowered enough to, to run for office. We have been speaking also about violence, but then what is the role of the political parties uh, to actually overcome this? And then maybe let's end up with a positive way of how do we overcome this? And then what is a good message uh, to continue fighting for diversity, inclusion, and representation. And maybe I would like to start with you, Gabor, because we're we're actually starting in Budapest. Uh, okay, so um, I want to talk to you about uh, one of the most embarrassing moments that I've had in office. It was like uh, um, we created a new institutional form to talk to uh, NGOs in different matters because there was not an institutionalized form for the capital of, uh, for that under the previous administration. And during one of these uh, discussions, we were evaluating how we fulfilled the strategy for equal opportunities in the past five weeks. And uh, uh, past five years, sorry. And uh, these NGOs just came at us with everything they had, saying that uh, all the evaluation that uh, we have written was bullshit and rubbish, and uh, even the past five-year strategy was like bullshit. Mm. And what they said that there was no, uh, it was not really uh, worthwhile putting any work into doing the evaluation better, making the evaluation better. We should focus our energy on writing a new strategy for the forthcoming five years. And uh, I think um, we managed to create a working atmosphere where we could uh, actually uh, try to write uh, a strategy and a program that was not uh, buzzword compatible, mm. but was actually based on real life data and with the inclusion of NGOs who were, you know, considered hostile under the previous administration. And I think this type of institutional inclusion is the way forward. And uh, um, that's something that I, I'm starting to become a bit proud of. Not, you know, uh, leaning back and saying that we are all right, but I think that we took uh, a step in the good direction. And I think these things 
our small successes but important. Obviously. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Thank if, you. If that. that is positive, no, that is extremely <laughs> positive, and I think that that's a very good engagement because also we will have a conversation about civil society organizations engaging with uh, with mm -hmm. political parties soon. Also, uh, Maria. Uh, On a good note. Um, <laughs> Well, <laughs> let me dig down. Deep. Let me think. <laughs> um, well, you know, I just jokingly said, you know, that people are joking within D66 now, you know, we're such an LGBTIQ party, you know, we should have a straight network. But I think the good news about that is that if you are consistent in your narrative, that you are open to whoever wants to be part of this D66 family, um, that you are welcome. And the people who choose to, um, to join D66 as a political party or support D66 as a political party know that the, the, the bottom line or the, 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 the value, the underlying value is that we are accepting of anybody and everybody and if you are not um, if you don't feel comfortable with that because of your own biases then d66 is not the party for you so i think you should just stick with the program stick with the narrative and it is going to be you know not something that is going to be deal done and dealt with in a couple of years this is i mean 66 refers back to the year that D66 was founded. So it's going to turn 57 this year. And I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to end on a negative note saying it's going to take 50 years to get there. But, you know, stick with the narrative and stick with, you know, what is the underlying value of your political party. And you will draw those to you that feel uh, drawn to that. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Leonard. Thank you for the question. I mean, as liberal, it's always good to uh, end up with, uh, with with the positivity. And there's, I think, quite a lot actually to be positive about. Um, maybe like the first example is like, we are not alone. So when something happened, I can very well remember when Orban was introducing the anti-LGBTI law here in, in Hungary. Um, there was a demonstration going on actually in Amsterdam against what was going on here in Hungary. I was there with Lisa Schreinemach, who is now a Minister of Trade, together with Claire, who is one of the colleagues of Maria. Uh, we were there demonstrating against what was going on here. Uh, there were several council members in the European Council uh, stepping up against what was going on here in Hungary. Uh, two liberal prime ministers, Javier Bittel and Mark Rutte, were very much taking the lead there. Like, this is not, um, it is not acceptable in the European Union. And that would have been unthinkable 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Then the European Union at the time was like, as long as it is allowed to be a gay person, like it shouldn't be forbidden, uh, but anything else is fine for your own democracy. We very much see that in several countries and the development in the entire European Union that um, uh, diversity and the acceptance of LGBTI persons is part of our values. And those, those places where that's under scrutiny, they were stepping up together to fight against it. So I think there's quite a lot actually to be positive about. Um, also, of course, what happened in Estonia uh, just before summer, where the, the second former communist country where they introduce same-sex marriage right now. So progress is still possible. Uh, and maybe to end actually with a very personal uh, reflection on like the younger generations also in the Netherlands. Last week I had the graduation of my uh, nephew. He went to a secondary school and uh, succeeded secondary school. And um, it's a very diverse school actually when it comes to ethnicities and etc. But homosexuality at that school actually was never a thing. And it was never a point for my nephew to have like two gay uncles where he enjoyed um, staying over the weekend, even now he's 17 years old. Uh, it was never a point for him, and it, there was never any kind of bullying against homosexuals in the school. Maybe that's still an exception at Dutch schools, because I know there are plenty of examples where things are going in a different direction. But I see actually in many countries that there's a generation growing up right now where this part of diversity is no longer something they want to, uh, they want to fight about. This is just something uh, they want to cherish and take it for granted. And I think that's a very positive thing for the future. Great. I mean, thank you very much. And then thank you all of you for participating. I mean, we're going to continue by making these uh, conversations uh, in Bratislava, in Amsterdam and in Malta during the Europe Pride. So uh, I think it's very important that actually as liberals, exactly as you said, 
we identify the problems, but we also give a bright perspective of, uh, of the type of world that we want to live in um, based on defending our individual freedoms. Thank you so much. That is the end of the program. Uh, so thank you. Next time. Thank, thank you. you.